As I mentioned earlier in the service, this is Trinity Sunday, in which the life of God, the shared life that God has in fellowship with himself through the persons of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, are expressed in the life of those who call themselves children of God, or maybe more accurately, are called children of God by God himself. This is a shared life of mutuality and love, perfect love and unity. And in the two texts that we read this morning, the first from John chapter 17, we have Jesus speaking his prayer to the Father about his disciples, his followers. His desire for them is that they will be united. We're going to touch on that again in just a moment. The second passage is from Ephesians chapter 4, in which the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and he implores them. It says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And again, this idea that we are united in Christ. In this month of June, we are focusing on the life of the church together. We are called to be a people of God together. Last Sunday, we had a joyous celebration as we saw Lindsay take the step of baptism in her faith journey, calling Jesus Lord and Savior of her life and dedicating her life to him. And then we had five more people who said, this fellowship here at Fort Gary is my home, my faith family, and I am a part of this, and I will walk together with you in this shared life of faith. We do this together as the church. Today, our focus is on being united together in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the coming weeks, we will focus on other aspects of our life together as the church. I'm, I, I will confess this morning that I have some pride in my heart. And... Uh, that's because I am so proud of my wife. Now, this past week on Friday, I got to go to the university and see my wife graduate with her master's of education. And I am so proud of all the hard work that she did to get there. I also saw Marcus there graduating as well. And I believe that was with a Bachelor of Social Work, is that correct? Awesome. Congratulations and well done on all your hard work. As I was there in that ceremony in the Investors Group Center, there's hundreds of graduates, all wearing the same robe, all with their black hat with the little tassel on it. They all were sharing a moment together. They have a shared experience of having reached their goal together. Many of them have shared classes, assignments, the university life together. And in that experience of becoming graduates of the University of Manitoba, they do have a shared identity as alumni of that institution. But as I was watching and listening, I realized that although they were sharing in that experience and that identity, what I saw before me, even though it looked uniform in that they're all wearing the same thing, this is not a group that is united in any way. Because each of those graduates, each of those students came to the university and took those courses for their own reasons, with their own thoughts and dreams about where it will take them and what they will do now that they have taken this step 
completed this chapter of their lives. For many, as they exit that graduation hall and drive off of the campus of the university, it will be the last time that they see, talk to, or share life in any sort of way with their classmates and friends from the university. Because they are not united. Having a shared experience is not the same thing as being united in unity with one another. Sure, shared experiences bond us together in some ways. When you've gone through a challenge together with someone else, you feel a a kinship with them. It's like, we did this together. We made it. And you always have a bond with that person. But so often that shared experience or that bond is limited to that context and that place and that moment in your life. And then you go your separate ways and you live your own lives. Unfortunately, many in the church try to go about their faith journey in that same way, thinking that perhaps by having shared experiences around worship, hearing the same sermon from the same pastor, singing the same songs, being together in the same space on a Sunday morning, that somehow this shared experience means that we will be united with one another in Christ. It certainly helps build on unity, but that in and of itself is not a foundation for our unity in Christ. You see, what builds us up in unity What makes us one as God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one is because we have a shared calling, a shared purpose together as the people of God. Kingdom citizens empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of each one of us sharing the same spirit because we have walked together through baptism and shared that one regenerating, life-giving step together as we move from death into the life of Christ. We are united because we are called to the same purpose together. And it is a purpose that cannot be fulfilled a calling that cannot be realized on our own. We can only fulfill our calling as people of God by becoming a people of God. As you look around the room this morning, you will see people of different ethnicities and backgrounds, different life experiences, some from traditional homes, others who have grown up in broken homes, some who have had great lives filled with joy and celebration, others whose lives have been a struggle from the very beginning. What unites us is not where we come from. What unites us here at Fort Geary is not our political view of the way that the world ought to be, seen through the lens of right or left, which are both wrong. We are not united because we have similar personalities. We're all, you know, fun-loving, outgoing extroverts. Absolutely not. Some of us are very much introspective, quiet, introverted, and we have our gifts to bring too. We are not united because we're all at the same place in our community, the same status, social acceptance level, financial situation. 
These are all things that can have affinities with one another, but none of these things bring about unity. Certainly, I know for a fact, we are not united here because of our worship preferences, because we all love the same kind of worship music and style of worship that I, I know. There are some here who would love us to be dancing in the aisles with the music turned up as loud as you can. You got that, tech crew? Some of us would be most content with quiet music allowing space for reflection and meditation upon the words of Scripture or what God is speaking to our own hearts through the Spirit. This shared experience of worship is not what unites us. In fact, we are not even united by our beliefs. Think about that for a moment. It is not our beliefs that unite us here today. Our confessional understandings of who God is, how God works, and what God wants from us. That's not what unites us. If you've been in any of our Sunday school classes or in a life group and discussed reading scripture and discerning together what it means, you will know, as I know, that we read scripture often from very different places and end up with very different understandings of what Scripture calls us to, who God is and what God desires of us. We together as the Mennonite Brethren Church have a shared understanding called the Mennonite Brethren Confession of Faith. And sometimes we want to use that confession of faith to enforce a certain way of looking at the world and at God so that we can all be on the same page. And we think that that somehow means that we are united, that we have unity as a church or as a conference. But that is not what true unity is. Our shared confession is rather what we have come to agreement in community to see as our shared expression of faith, our shared expression of belief with variation and diversity within it, but we come together in this shared understanding that we can agree to together so that... Our confession and our beliefs are always so that we can accomplish something else. It is so we can walk in the unity of Christ for the sake of our calling in Jesus Christ. I don't know if you heard it in the scriptures that were read this morning. In Jesus' prayer to his Father, John 17, verse 21, And may they be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. I want these whom you have given to me to be with me. Then they can all see the glory you gave me. I have revealed you to them so that your glory, your name, your good news can be revealed to the world. We are to make, maintain the unity of the body so that. The church is not just a place to come and worship and to be built up in our own understanding of faith, to be encouraged and patted on the back in our own individual walk with Christ. We as the church have a calling, a, un, a divine purpose that has been given to us and I have been so excited over the last couple of months as we have seen new expressions of the calling that God is giving to us here at Fort Gary of how to reach into our community through the focus partnership that you're going to be hearing about in a couple of days, through our reaching out through English classes for our community, through our drop-in programs for the families that live next door, for the Persian church 
that was, is now meeting here at Fort Gary and will be walking with us as we reach out into our community. I'm so excited about how God is working out that calling here in this place among us and calling us to unite, to offer all of who we are and our gifts to carry out that calling. I am so excited to see what God is going to do as we walk in this unity together. But I'm sure that you want some practical ways to think about unity. What does it look like for us to be a fellowship of faith that is united in Christ? For that, I'm going to share with you a few ideas from a book that is foundational to my own understanding. That's called Anabaptist Essentials. It's written by Palmer Becker, and it talks about what it looks like to be the Church of Christ from an Anabaptist perspective. He breaks this down into three main categories of the life of the church. The first is this, that Jesus is the center of our faith. One, Jesus is the center of our faith. Two, that community is the center of our lives. Community is the center of our lives. And three, that reconciliation is the center of our work. So let's explore a little bit about what he means in these three ways that we walk in unity as the people of God. Jesus is the center of our faith. Well, you may think that's a pretty obvious statement. We're only here because of Jesus, because we've encountered the living Jesus. We believe in Jesus, and we have given our lives to him. But the way that Palmer Becker plays this out in this, this section of his book, he talks about that Jesus being the center of our faith looks like some very specific things. If Jesus is the center of of our faith, that means that Christianity is daily discipleship, that we follow Jesus daily because Jesus is the center of our lives. Jesus is the one who provides definition for where I go, how I go, and who I go with, and who I go to. And this is not just a one time in my life. Yes, I'm going in this general direction. This is an everyday walking with Jesus. He also says that Jesus is the lens through which we read and understand Scripture. For those of us who have been part of the Mennonite or Anabaptist church for most of our lives, this may seem like a natural way of reading Scripture, but it is not always this way. Many times we try to read scripture in a flat way. We find a verse somewhere in the Bible. We say, well, because it's the Bible, this verse has to be true. And then we take that verse and we try to apply it into our lives or to our church or to the way that we live. And we find that it doesn't seem to work very well. It doesn't give us a full understanding what we understand together, if Jesus is the center of our faith, then Jesus is also the center of the scriptures. All that was written before him points towards him, and all that comes after tries to explain him, and the life of Jesus is found in the Gospels, gives us a picture, gives us the fullest picture of who God is, God with us, God for us. In his life and in his teachings, we see God at work in our midst and in our world, and we look to that life of Jesus to explain the rest of what we find in Scripture, whether through the Old Testament or in the epistles and what follows his life. If Jesus is the center of our faith, then it also means that for us, as believers, Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? Well, the thing is that many of us, actually I would say all of us here who call ourselves followers of Jesus, would say that Jesus is our Savior. Is that right? Jesus has saved us through his death and his resurrection on the cross. But some of us are content to just leave it at Jesus has saved me. 
But what Jesus is doing and teaching is that he is the Son of God. He is not just the one who saves us. He is our God. He is our Lord. He is the one who has supreme authority in our lives. So when it comes to how we live and what decisions we will make, what direction we will go, we go wherever Jesus goes. We do whatever Jesus does. We choose that which Jesus chooses. If it means the path of suffering, we choose what Jesus chooses. If it means the path that is harder, we choose the path that Jesus chooses because Jesus is not just my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. The question that I want to leave with you today And if you have a pen and paper, I want you to write this down and look at it later this week or later today. What is the center of your faith? What is the center of your faith? If Jesus is meant to be the center of our shared faith, what about you as an individual? What is the center of your faith? Is it a specific theological worldview? Is it a set of rules and regulations, some boxes that you need to check off to be called a son of God? Or some people, unfortunately, live with guilt and shame at the center of their faith. Jesus is the center of our shared faith. Number two, community is the center of our life. We are called out. There's a word in the Greek that uh, is used to describe these people that become the church. They are called ecclesia or ecclesia. If you've ever heard of that name, that word in Greek, it means those who are called out. Ek, like exit, ecclesia, it means like the calling. So you are called out. You're called out from what you were into something else. We are the called out ones, called out into a community of God. Becker says that in order for us to live in this way, where community, this this people defined by Jesus living in shared life, in order for this to happen in unity, this means that forgiveness is essential within the community. Because in Christ, we are not only forgiven, by God for our sins, but we are called to forgive and walk in a position of forgiveness with one another. What is a position of forgiveness? That means that my heart is set on the ways of God. And so that means that when I am offended, when I am hurt, when I am betrayed, when others have done wrong to me, my position before my brothers and sisters is already that I am ready to forgive and I may have already forgiven in my heart before they confess, before amends have been made, but I am in a position of forgiveness already. If community is the center of our life, that means that God's will is discerned together in community. It's not God and I figuring life out on our own. It is we together, the people of faith, studying the scriptures together, giving and receiving the gifts that God has given to us, not only the spiritual gifts, but the gifts of understanding and revelation that God gives to each one of us so that I speak into the lives of those around me and I hear from God about my own life, a dialogue of faith that keeps us walking this faith life together, which leads to the third point that he makes, and that is if community is the center of our life, then our members of this body walk in accountability with one another. We share the same life. We are in relationship with one another, whether it's through our small groups, our life groups, whether it's through mentors who speak into our lives intentionally, or partnership in discipling together, 
reading Scripture, praying together, we share this life. Which leads to the question that I'm leaving with you today. What is the center of your life? If community is the center of our united life in Christ, what is the center of your life? Is it the calling and community of Jesus? The third section is this. Reconciliation is the center of our work as the people of God. Reconciliation is the center of our work as a people of God. In the last month or so, we have talked much of reconciliation as we have considered what it looks like to come alongside our indigenous community to confess, to bear one another's burdens, and to make amends and to walk together in this life together. Reconciliation is the work of the church. It is the center of our shared life and unity in Christ. It means several things. One is that we as individuals are reconciled to God, where the Spirit of God takes the place at the center of our lives as individuals, rather than I being at the center of my life, where I always am the one that interprets what I feel, where I'm going, what I'm thinking. What do I think about this? What do I feel about this in my life? What do I think I'm going to do about this? What happens is that when we are reconciled to God, the Spirit of Christ enters in and takes that center spot in our lives, and it becomes, what does Christ think about this in my life? What is the Spirit of God feeling about where I am at in this situation? Where is Christ going and how will I go with Christ in this situation? The second kind of reconciliation is that we as members are reconciled to one another. It extends beyond just God and I being reconciled to each other. And we find this reconciliation lived out through the principle of the rule of Christ. The rule of Christ is found in Matthew chapter 18. And if you haven't read it for a while, I invite you, go and read Matthew 18, in which is laid out a process by which we come back together when our fellowship, our unity, has been broken. At the heart of this process, the rule of Christ, is the restoration of our relationship with one another. So often in the way that we try to be united in the church is that we think that we have to resolve the thing that we are in disagreement about. That somehow if we can convince one another, somehow through force of argument or by citing specific scriptures that somehow I can get you to see things my way, then we can be united. But that is not the unity of the people of God. The unity of the people of God is found in our relationship towards one another and our shared relationship towards Christ. So, even though we may not agree, our relationship is restored and we continue to walk together regardless of our diversity. And finally, the way that reconciliation is the center of our work is that conflicts in our world are reconciled through the mediation of the people of God. It means that we move outward into our world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And the way that we do this is consistent with the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus who is the center of our faith. It means that we move forward into our world where there is brokenness with non-violent action. We don't just sit back and pray. Praying is good. Praying is excellent. And we ought to all be praying on our own and united in prayer. But we do more than pray. We act. The way that we act is by moving 
towards the brokenness that we see. Coming alongside those who are experiencing brokenness and the effects of destruction and sin in their lives. And this often means that like Jesus, we self-sacrificially are putting ourselves in harm's way for the sake of the good news. Conflicts in the world are also reconciled as we move towards uh, restorative justice. Seeing things put right, not through punishment of those who have offended, though that is sometimes what is part of it, but rather thinking in ways of remediation, rebuilding what has been broken, and restoring relationship for those who are involved, both those who have been offended and hurt, and those who have done the offense. This leads to the third question I leave with you today. What is the center of our church's work? What is the center of Fort Gary's work together as a body? If reconciliation is the center of the good news of Jesus Christ and the center of the work of the people of God, does our fellowship, our life together, uh, reflect this kind of reconciliation? Or is the life of this body focused on programs, building fellowship, being busy together in the name of Christ? Answer the question, what is the center of Fort Gary's work? In this life of unity, shared calling and purpose in Jesus Christ, what is essential to our unity is the presence of the Spirit of God, that we must always, together and on our own, be seeking the presence of the Spirit, listening for the words of God spoken to our hearts, nudging us, turning us towards Jesus who is at the center and moving towards and acting through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the power to use the gifts that God has given to us for the sake of our church and for his body, the church around the world, but also to be moved into lives that reflect his glory in every way that we can conceive of. So may we be a people that are united with one body, with one spirit, called to one hope in our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. And may be he be glorified by our lives together. Thank you for listening to this message from Fort Gary MB Church. We hope that what you heard challenged you to think in new ways about Jesus Christ and the life that we are called to through his death and resurrection. If you have any questions about who we are as a church, our mission, or have any other questions in general, please do not hesitate to contact our office email at info at fgmb.ca. Be blessed.